I am now honored to introduce as keynote speaker Mr. Zhang Xinxiang, the distinguished former Vice Minister of Education of the People's Republic of China and current president of the China Scholarship Council and chairman of the Chinese National Commission for UNESCO, among many, many other appointments and tasks. Uh, Vice Minister John's career continues to be rich and multifaceted, but overall continues to be defined by leadership and service at the national and global levels in the fields of education, cultural preservation, as well as in many other areas of critical social and cultural importance. Much more can be said about uh, uh, Vice Minister John's uh, life and work, and some details are given in the program. But now, I want the time to be uh, Vice Minister John. So, I, I uh, happily introduce him to important figure in 
this uh, 21st century, since the United States is the strongest mm -hmm. in terms of science, talk, technology, education, and economy. And China, the country, has the longest continuing history, largest population, which is very dynamic, and one of the largest economy. And in your term, you say PPP is the two largest one. <laughs> so, uh, and also last century, the travel, the mobility, mainly between Atlantic and this century, if we do it well, it might go parallel between not only Atlantic, but also Pacific. So that is why we can regard this G2, China and the United States are the one who play and has already played a very, very significant and critical role in this world. While this world, if one asks me to predict this one word, what is the future? <coughs> or in two words, what's the major changes? So in what? The two major changes, I would like to say, the globalization, first one, <coughs> which is still accelerating, independent of man's will. Second, is a knowledge society. The knowledge has played such an important role as we have seen more and more and wider and wider. If I have been asked to use one word to depict the fiction of this century, I use one word, uncertainty. The change has been so fast so wide, so deep, so dynamic. So how to predict even in the near future is so much difficult. Ever since, I would like to say, the year of 2000, then up till now is the financial crisis, but more so with the global climate change. That is why with such a big extent of uncertainty. The exchange, the cooperation, the partnership, <coughs> the exchange with sincerity, with the trust. Search for the true knowledge is so much important for us. Not only for the beneficial of the Columbia and the China's universities, the United States and China, and also the world as a whole. So this is uh, something of my uh, first reflection in uh, being accepted by the invitation and attending this 60 years anniversary of the East Asia Institute of Studies, the Institute of East Asia Studies of Columbia. Since the founding in 1949, the Weatherhead East Asia Institute has become the center of the research, teaching, and the publication of modern and contemporary East Asia studies, making remarkable contributions to a better understanding of East Asia by the American world as large, and to advocating the exchanges of the diverse civilizations. With a long tradition of China studies, a number of sinologists and experts gathered in the Institute, which is an important base for sinology and the contemporary Chinese studies in America. And it's well known and influential among students studying the states and the Chinese scholars overseas. The study and the research carried out by the Institute has not only facilitated the academic and the cultural exchanges between China and the United States, but also helped US government and the people with a better understanding of China. At the moment, when China and the United States are enjoying steady bilateral relations and the increasingly deepening exchange and collaboration when the whole world is jointly dealing with the global financial crisis, the Institute for Colombia and China, the this <coughs> past and future as the theme of today's symposium. And also, I particularly enjoy uh, that uh, three sub-topics, uh, 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 that is in the financial area, in the cultural and the social area, 
and also regarding sustainability with the climate change and uh, uh, what we call the ecology of civilization. I believe, as I said, this symposium will surely put forward some new consensus about the issue among China and the US scholars. And also practitioners, as I know that many of these uh, Columbia alumni are working in the financial area uh, located in China or academic or scientific research or even in the government. Now a few words about Columbia. I quite appreciate that just now uh, the director and also vice president mentioned about the special relation and also special contribution that Columbia has been done for the modern China history. That is why it enjoys high reputation around the world for its time honored history, distinctive school branding style, outstanding academic accomplishments. During the past 200 years, the university has cultivated numerous famous politicians, scientists, artists, entrepreneurs, and social activists. And we all know the Theodore Roosevelt. Franklin Roosevelt, and also uh, uh, President Roosevelt, and all from Columbia, and uh, those famous scientists, uh, and the Nobel Prize winners, and those in the education fields and the social fields. Columbia University developed a long-term bond with China, and they established a deep, friendly, relationship with Chinese people, a number of notable figures, acquainted by all Chinese families used to study on campus. As you just now mentioned, Gu Shi, Gu Weijun, Ma Yingchu, Fei Yulan, Feng Yulan, and uh, Wu Wenzhao, and etc. We know that uh, it's present from Beijing University and the Tsinghua University past those are uh, the graduates from the Columbia University. So in a way, we can say that the China's uh, educational field, especially more than the high education field, is so much influenced by you, your university, Columbia. And uh, the John Dewey's philosophy has been widely practiced, actually, in China. Right now, we are doing uh, preparation work for the next medium and long-term uh, strategic plan for education till the year 2020. So uh, this kind of influence we can see still find here and there. Now a few words uh, about uh, Sino-US relations. The relationship between Columbia University and China is the epitome of the China-US relation, which has undergone up and downs, and the weather, weather all difficult situation during a persistent progress. This year marks the 60 anniversary of the founding of the People's Republic of China and the 30 years anniversary of the establishment of China-U.S. diplomatic relations. The evolution of China-U.S. relations in the past 60 years falls into two 30 years period. During the first 30 years, our two nations were locked in anagonism and mutual Seclusion. It was not until President <coughs> Richard Nixon's 1972 visit at China, the invitation, that is the avenue for the dialogue between our two nations, was opened. Actually, three of that was a U.S. A ping pong team <laughs> was invited to China. So it's also regarded as a ping pong diplomacy. The second 30 years period was marked by the official establishment of China-US diplomatic relations 
and a successful visit of the United States by Deng Xiaoping, the chief architect for China's reform and opening. Both events turned over a new page in the annals of our bilateral relations. Over the last three decades, despite all the twists and turns, the relationship between our two nations has stood all sorts of pace and developed in depth thanks to the common efforts of our leaders and our people. I should especially mention about public diplomacy. That's to say, mainly by the educators, scholars, intellectuals, cultural, sport peoples, and also in the health areas. This public diplomacy has played such an important role because as a government to government, it is nearly in a history, both on the broad, unavoidable, some twists and turns, ups and downs. Our scholars with common principle and belief in search of the truth, and also is a civil relation and unofficial. So once you establish this channel and accord it, no matter on the governmental level, how much twists and turns it has gone, scholars still maintain its change and for their joint interest and believing for searching of the truth, they still maintain a firm and a consistent a continuing relation, which in a turn influence each government, which I believe is very important and that this role can only play by the university. And now for other institutions or entities can replace such an important role. In this regard, the university is a typical example. And I believe when we looking forward in the future, how to maintain and deepen it and widen this kind of uh, relation and accordance are so much important. As I said, the China-US relation has become the most important bilateral relations on this planet. It's the most populous developing country. China has enormous potentials for development and a massive market. As the most powerful developed country, America has the most advanced science, technology, education, and a unique economic advantage in the world to set up collaboration, establish strategic partnership between these two nations. It's a choice of the multiple win situation. The growing connections between us not only benefit the two people, but also provide vigorous impetus to peace, stability, prosperity of the entire world. I think you, your colleagues, you will agree that education exchange and cooperation is a significant pillar in China-US relations. Over the years, I've been working in education sectors and are committed to China's education exchange and a cooperation with our foreign counterparts. In these years of the practice, I truly believe and understand that people-to-people -people exchange is one between hearts and soul based on the common belief, search for the truth, and making the prospect of parity for the mankind as a whole. And this kind of emotional and rational communication, which is fundamental and forward-looking, extensive and persistence. Trade is important. Economic relations is also important. Other science and the technology fields, uh, or health fields, all fields are important. But in final analysis, this kind of exchange and the cooperation is people to people, the person to person, without deep understanding of each other, without heart to heart exchange. Those kind of, no matter how big the trade it is, still located on the sand hill. So that is why education has a such 
profound and important role to play. And we should, while we recall the past history, as I mentioned, the two leading universities, Tsinghua and the Beida, some other universities, their presence and the leading professors, a large percentage, so happily coming from Colombia, which I believe laid the foundation. Sometimes the people give that credit to Erica Snow, the rest of the China. But what is missed or overlooked is this education contribution in those kind of histories, which is making it more consistent, more continuing, and a more uh, enduring relationship. Therefore, education exchange and cooperation play an irreplaceable role in expanding common grounds and understanding between nations and in enhancing the friendship and mutual understanding between peoples. Since, and also is educating young people, while both of our countries, the young people, that this world is ours, this world is also theirs. In fact, of analysis, this world is theirs, in their head, like many of the alumni I see your young face here. The future is placed on you, the China and the U.S. future relationship. So this is a particular importance. Since the establishment of China-U.S. diplomatic relations and the joint efforts of the both sides, education exchange and cooperation have been developing steadily between both governments, while the non-government exchange has become increasingly active with enlarged scale, broadening areas of remarkable achievements. I'm very happy this year, uh, last month when I stepped down uh, from the Vice Minister's rep, uh, with the efforts of the four years. Last year, we have su successfully holding the Sino-U.S. Education Governmental uh, Summit uh, balance. Because we established with Australia, New Zealand, the European major countries, German, French, England, Austria, Italy, etc. The uh, U.S. Uh, is, the, is the one at that time has not established. So I always has a goal. The, the <coughs> university to university exchange is so much important. By government established certain mm -hmm. magnets is also important. So with a joint efforts, last year uh, I led a delegation in the in the late April, uh, meeting with the Secretary of the Education and also Assistant Secretary of the State Council. This, uh, three uh, uh, sites uh, uh, magnets established. I hope that uh, uh, with the new government, and I believe mm -hmm. this kind of magnets can continue, so that uh, no matter you know, something happened, but this change can still maintain. For instance, after uh, September 11 uh, incident, uh, the, the visa for China scholars and the students went to the United States was, uh, was uh, uh, met with difficulties. Uh, with, uh, finally, we uh, have the university's help and the passing words to the U.S. leaders and the State Department, Education Department. So it has been solved much earlier than other countries. And I think that this kind of uh, <coughs> mechanism is also important. And the meanwhile, study about uh, how can we enlarge more students to have exchange. Even though the United States is still the first destination for China stu students to choose because of the unique attractions over there. But I think that the competition already started. Take in uh, EU, for instance, the Erasmus program has been deepening and widening. 800 universities in the European, uh, in the Europe, uh, not only EU, uh, but also 40, uh, 47, 48, uh, with the Mongolian, uh, uh, 
new country. So altogether, eight hundred universities now constantly improve their way to attract the China students and the scholars to have exchange. And also, the, some leading universities, for instance, in the United States, already established their overseas campus in China, the university, so as to let emigrate the students to have a one term with a mutual recognition of the credits established. So much importance. Uh, last time, your president Lee volunteer led a large delegation and uh, established uh, a, a Columbia Center in China. I think this is a very visionary and a very strategic uh, approach. Now, I think I should uh, uh, deal a little bit with your three major topics. The first, the financial crisis impact on China. Currently, the global financial crisis is still spreading and deepening, which, even though there are some good signs already appearing, which brings a serious impact on economic growth and the daily life of all nations. This crisis also brings China unprecedented difficulties and challenges, many as follows. The downward pressure on China's economy grows, imports and exports continue to decline, industrial production is obvious and slowing down, some enterprises encounter difficulties of the production and operation, and it has been more difficult to get employed. This global financial crisis takes place in a critical period when China is transforming her approach from development and adjusting her economy structure. New challenges and existing conflicts are intervening, which increase the difficulty to tackle the problem. To cope with impact brought by the global financial crisis and maintain stable and rapid economic development, China timely adjusted macroeconomic policies, decidedly implemented a productive fiscal policy, and a moderately loosened monetary policy and set up package of steps to further expand the domestic demand and promote economic growth. We vastly expand government expenditures, implement a two years investment plan of total 600 billion of US dollars, and the policies of a structural tax reduction cut interest rate for several times and enhance the fluidity of the banking system, implement projects for larger scale industrial readjustment and a revival and, and greatly accelerate science innovation and technology upgrading, strengthen energy saving and emission reduction and environmental protection. Continue at the restructuring of national income distribution, vigorously explore domestic market, especially in rural areas, and elevate social security by a large margin. Up to now, all these steps has been born initial results and indicate a positive momentum with relatively strong domestic consumption, consumer demands, increasing steady investment demands and a stable society. I'm particularly happy that in the first quarter, the consumer increase is over two digits comparing with the same period last year. I mean, the domestic consumption is already taken turn for the better, uh, let alone for the uh, stimulus plans by the infrastructure, infrastructure uh, investment and the restructure of our economy and the industry. Now, you might ask that why China can do that somewhat different from others. Uh, I would like to see two points which might be interesting of you. First, China's reform taking a, a slow and uh, incremental approach. This step-by-step -step incremental approach has made China really different from all those transitional countries like former USSR, East European countries, and from many of the 
of developing countries. Is all China's reform an incremental way? No. For instance, some of the system reforms is just done like that, like a big bang. For instance, after the Cultural Revolution, we take only a little bit more than two years to eliminate all the people's commune. This is not a slow process, because we see it clearly. The system of ownership of the land is so critical for liberation of the production for all the farmers. Secondly, we see that China basically still, at that time, was a, a agro civilization, a, a farmer's country. So how to solve the critical interest is so much importance. So for this kind of reform, it just done in two years. But for the economic reform, transforming from uh, formerly central, rigidly controlled, planned economy into market economy with uh, China's uh, socialistic feature, we are very prudent. Because number one, China is a huge country. We have not completed its industrialized process yet. And uh, number two, China has a huge population, 80% was farmers, now 60%. We have successfully tra transformed that big percentage uh, into the urbanized you know, uh, process and <coughs> become citizens. And number three, we do not that much blind trust that of the market system. Market and market failure. It has its unique advantage, but it also has its drawbacks. So we got to see how this kind of practice can really play in another land. And the thirdly, which is also my personal experience, uh, that, that is to say we believe uh, more of a grafting instead of uh, uh, totally uh, transplanting and uh, totally just a copy other models. That's to say, everything pro proceeding from China's reality. So that is why we take this in the past 30 years. We gradually you know, reform. We regard it as evolution. Always uh, judging from international situation and uh, proceeding from China's reality. This is, uh, I think, first important. And <coughs> reason. And the second is high saving level, which has been uh, blamed by some of the Western media. But it has its China's own context, China's history, and the international background. As you know, our physical believing, uh, the Jews start from Confucius period, will always believe that to expand according to its revenue and income, not only in a family, city, university, or in a, in a country. We always take a prudent financial policy. And also family. So number one investment is not housing. Number one investment is uh, child education. They must have a sufficient saving, uh, even in the relatively poor rural areas, for their kids to be educated. And thirdly, China's uh, modern social safety net has not been established. You uh, notice that China now has a new uh, total package for the medical and the pharmaceutical uh, reform, which will cover all the Chinese people, but in three different kinds. Still farmers, citizens, and also the uh, 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 citizens with uh, employed institutes. That's Again, it's a gradual you know, reform to establish this kind of system. And thirdly, there are also international situations. For instance, in the financial crisis in 1997 and 1998, China was the last country and the only country in whole Asia to be able to stop that kind of chain reaction of the de uh, devaluation of the currency which actually served not only China, but also whole Asia. The one 
much larger economic country just devalued their currency. So we see that how much importance. It's also IMF's plan. They advocate that, that those countries has a financial deficiency should raise saving level. So that is why I think that these two make us in a much better and easier position in handling with this financial crisis. Second topic. I'm not taking too much time. OK, yes. Second, re re regarding cultural, local, and global. I so much like this topic, but I just said one or two points. OK, we're not elaborate. And number one, we believe in the diversity and the harmony. We say gentlemen might differ from each other, but in a good harmony pattern. We believe, you know, uh, uh, mono makes things unproductive, while uh, diversity makes things productive. So this is a, a very, very much important. Start from the language, for instance. So that is why I think that uh, for the culture, which has a, such an important role to play, I must uh, comment that the United States has a successfully making U.S. culture not only a very flourishing in your country, but also very much popular, popular in the whole world. So the culture, global and the local, is a, such an important topic for us to, to have exchange and for Chinese to learn from the United States. And uh, we uh, plan to uh, make China into a learning nation because we believe in dialogue uh, the dialogue must be based on the, uh, the, tr the truth and the believing to learn from each other based on the free mutual understanding depths. Such a learning encourages many people to think about the necessity of becoming a learning nation for e effective global dialogue. A learning nation is supposed to be a receptive and inclusive nation ready to learn from other nations. It can be Met metaphorically compared to an ocean open to all incoming water resources because it locate, locates itself in a modest position. And in such circumstances, it is claimed to follow the principle that unit in a patronized mode is far less creative than diversity in a harmonized form. And uh, finally, the topic regarding sustainability. This is, a, this is a, a, such an important one as a climate change and the ecosystem degradation have been uh, affected this planet for decades. The underlying conflicts and the problems, however, have outstripped the scientific and the technological world into politics economy and the culture and every aspect of people's life. The need for a green economy and that green revolution. Ecological civilization has arrived with advent of the new century. And it is increasingly clear that to achieve and improve on a green economy and a sustainable development needs the joint efforts and the long-term commitments from all the stakeholders. We believe in that, you know, the one of the important decision is number 70, uh, China's uh, Central Committee of the Chinese Communist Party's decision. Formerly, we have a three. Formerly, uh, uh, we have two civilization uh, building. First is material, second is spiritual civilization. In the 16th uh, uh, Central Committee's uh, uh, conference, we added political civilization. But, uh, in the year of 2000, 2007, in the 70s, uh, committee we add the eco civilization. So this is a very important. For instance, the city located in the southwest <coughs> is a much less developed city. It's a plan to have a, a eco forum. That's to say to to build a platform for all the stakeholders, the governmental, the business, the academic the industry, so as they share the opinion 
out with the joint and the long committed efforts and uh, to solve this common problem for this one. So these are my uh, 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 very, uh, uh, how to say, not a deeply thought it uh, viewpoints. Some are just uh, speak off the cuff. And I hope you will understand. And anyway, I just want to have uh, uh, such a direct dialogue with you. And I think that this is 60 years anniversary for the East Institute study of the weather here. It's so much important. And it will be a milestone uh, uh, event. Thank you.